you know, something that you've overcome. Like they weren't thinking that this was going to be the thing. They didn't even know. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> Is this, <laughs> am I supposed to share this with the whole church? <laughs> Welcome to Book Therapy. I'm your host, Kim Patton. There's no way to count how many books are floating around in this world. Some are decent, some are truly terrible, and some are great. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into one great book. Together, we will discover gems of truth and encouragement to help you face your current season of life. I'm ready. You're ready. Let's get this party started. Hello, hello, friends. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I have another interview with a special guest. And her book is Brand Spankin' New. So it is fresh, hot off the press, and I think you guys are going to really like it. Before we get to that, I just wanted to let you know that my Kickstarter is off and running, and there's still two weeks left. So head to the website, kimpatton.com, and check out the Kickstarter campaign. I have reward tiers starting with a paperback book, ranging all the way to paper book, ebook, audiobook, behind the scenes, a special one-on-one party, stuff like that. So go check it out. Let's dive into the book. Today we have an author on the podcast talking about her beautiful brand new book, Reason to Return, Why Women Need the Church and the Church Needs Women. This is written by Erica Anderson and welcome to the show, Erica. Thank you, Kim. I'm so glad to be here with you. Erica is a freelance journalist who has worked on all types of topics, politics, faith, and recently women's interests. She's a mama to two kiddos, and she lives with her husband and family in Indiana. Her first book, Leaving Cloud Nine, was an amazing testimony of God's grace, and I highly recommend it. Erica, tell me how book launch is going and how the world has been receiving your message. Yeah, so book launch has been really good and positive. It's a little overwhelming, you know, just because you can't ever do too much with a book launch. And so Mm -hmm. you want to do everything, but you can't because you have life and family. Mm -hmm. So got a lot of great um, media opportunities and just so many people interested in this topic and really surprised by some of it. I read in your email this morning, which I thought was interesting. um, You mentioned that this book is sort of evergreen and it is a topic that we're going to be talking about for a long time. So does that kind of take the pressure off of of, okay, I'm going to be selling this for a while. I don't need to kill it all right now. Yes, definitely. I, uh, you know, I went into this a lot different than I did with my first book. Um, my first book, I just, the, I had been given the impression that like, it's all about launch week and that's, you know, the big deal. And then like after launch week, I just, everything went silent. I didn't hear from the publisher again. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was Mm -hmm. so lost and confused. And so when that came time around to do this book, I said, okay, I get this. Like the publisher is like, kind of like they've done their job. And so now, you know, it's time to just like really get down to business. And so, um, I feel like I'm really just getting started. Um, it's a long-term process and, um, I'm coming up with new ideas every day and, and it's even really actually getting me excited about, um, continuing to sell my first book, which I kind of let go by the wayside. Cause I just didn't understand that you were supposed to keep selling. I just felt so in the dark, <laughs> you know, it's like I was with this huge publisher and they just don't tell you things. Mm. So I learned the hard way. I'm back around this time and I'm feeling very good about it. And I think it is going to be a success. Oh, definitely. Um, so to set up basically what this book is about, I love this beautiful quote on page 132, and this relates to many of my moments personally with my experience with church. You say, I can walk into church utterly resistant, unhappy to be there with a headache spiking and doubts lurking, but the moment voices lift in praise, it's like we all momentarily let go of the baggage that consumes our lives. We're going to talk about a few themes that, that were represented in your book. But this gives us a picture of what the church can be, the healing place that it is, the connection with God. I know you say elsewhere that, of course, you can. We are the church. We don't have to go to a building to be the church. But there's beauty in going to a building. There's beauty with connecting with other people. And so we're going to talk about those types of things. So the first thing that I noticed right away was this word you kept using, holistic faith. 
tell me about holistic faith, what it means to you and how you talk about it in the book. I don't remember like what kind of implored me to, to put that notion into the book, but I loved it because I think of, you know, you, you hear the term holistic health and that just sort of means whole body health. And I thought holistic faith. I mean, like you don't have like you need a well-rounded faith. There are different components that go into a healthy spiritual life. And while my book is focused on the church as one of the, you know, as a main component, it is just one, I think one of the components of a healthy spiritual life. So in addition to talking about the importance of gathering with other believers, I'm talking about, you know, the importance of prayer, praise, um, the importance of giving back and being a part of um, the community uh, and, and all the different ways that your faith um, can be lived out in all of its fullness. Um, and I do think that the one of the foundational parts of a holistic faith is committing to gathering with believers as the Bible calls us to do, because I truly believe that um, God reveals himself in a way that he doesn't um, in isolation. And I think that's a really powerful thing that people don't even sometimes realize that they're missing out on. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. On page 50, you say that the church offers something that other activities do not. In reality, most of the items on your calendar and to-do list aren't spiritually satisfying. They are tiny straws used to sip out your energy and spirit little by little throughout the week. A vibrant church life can have the opposite effect. What if the effort you put into getting to church resulted in a more peaceful, connected, fulfilling life overall? So the argument you're making here is, I like how you say sip at the little tiny straws that sip out your energy as a writer. That's like a great phrase. So good job there. (laughs) (laughs) But the argument you're making is, hey, it's worth the effort. So tell me about that. What, you know, what I found in my research is that one of the top reasons that women have left the church is not necessarily, you know, that they are hating God or they're deconverting from Christianity. It's just that they're overwhelmed, they're stressed life is busy. The church, you know, we're becoming more of a post-Christian culture. So going to church is just not as much of a priority for culture in general. And so when people are looking for something to let go of, that's one of the things they let go of because it's the only time in their week that they have any downtimes. You know, that's a lot of what it is. You know, everything has its own sort of value and, and the energy that it takes from you. And we all have to think about like what's most important in life. And if our spiritual health and our faith and our relationship with God is something that we say is important, which by the way, in the surveys of women that I saw for this book, they said it was very important to them. Um, but in action, in the same surveys, they said they were not actually putting that anywhere on their priority list. And so what I'm saying is to get what you really want out of life, you're going to have to put that, that thing first. And so for example, like if you were going to, I don't know, if you went looking for, say, say you went looking for energy, like you could eat some gummy worms, right? And maybe that <laughs> for a second, but better off, you're going to eat some like quinoa and vegetables and that is going to give you lasting energy for the day. And I sort of think of, you know, gathering in the church as that sort of spiritual nourishment, that sort of spiritual food that's going to have a lasting impact. And, and it's a real investment in your spiritual future that you're going to be able to use down the road. Investment is a great word. And throughout the book, you definitely mentioned the, the work that it takes to, cultivate this holistic faith. It's not just something that you're going to get, like you said, gummy worms, like you really have to put the effort forth and it's going to be messy and it's going to be imperfect. But in the end, like you said, the priorities, we can say that we want something, but are we willing to do the work to actually get the thing that we say that we want? (laughs) Right. And and I, I can hear a friend of mine, I'm thinking of a specific person. I can hear her saying this. I need to get back to church. I know we need to do that. I know I want to, I want to start going. She's been saying that for like four years. She still hasn't gone. Mm. So I think there's a lot of that. Um, And that's why I'm asking women to like seriously stop for a moment. And I, you know, I really, I was on another podcast like, like a couple months ago and it was honestly, it wasn't even a Christian podcast. It was just about, it was actually about marketing 
it's a long story. <laughs> but asking me, so why do you want women to hear this message? Or like, you know, what is the deeper thing? She kept going, get deeper, get deeper, get deeper. And I was like, ultimately, because I want them to live fulfilling lives and know God better and spread the gospel and go to heaven. Like, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> what really matters? So on page 127, you talk a little bit about crying in church. And I love that because of course I've had so many moments where God meets me at church and you say in moments of darkness, we often don't know what we need until God provides it. That's part of the beauty of showing up is you don't, you don't know where you need intense healing until you show up and God meets you there and speaks to your heart and not saying that every Sunday you're going to have these moments where, you know, you're able to go home and, and re reorient your entire life because everything is so clear now, but just the compassion of the Lord is found when you hear the worship music and you're in the presence of other people who are all trying their best to focus on God in that moment. And there's there's real connection there and there's real redemption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Um, how you said you didn't know you needed it. And you've heard people say, I didn't know I needed that. And, and that is true. And I said, I was speaking in front of my church a couple of weeks ago and I said, listen, I come to church no matter how I feel. Like, I don't care if I'm in the worst mood, like I never skip church. And it's not because I'm like some legalistic, pious, you know, girl. It's because I know that something good always awaits me. And I know that it's always brighter and it's always lighter. And one of my favorite things to talk about that I do write about in the book is um, a quote from Sam Albury, which I don't know that he actually like came up with this, but um, <laughs> he talks about like the church is an embassy of heaven on earth. And so when we walk into the church, we are actually not on earth anymore. We are actually in heaven in the presence of God. And I just, when I read that, I could never stop thinking about it. Cause I was like, wow, we're in a different space when we're gathered with believers in the church. Like the church is an embassy of heaven. Like there's something special going on there. You can't get that at your house. I mean, you can, <laughs> you can, I'm not saying you can't like hear from the Holy spirit and gather at a house. Um, and gathering is not about the building. It's about the people that are there, but there's just something different. Um, and I just think that's the coolest concept. Wow. I like embassy of heaven. I mean, that's, that is otherworldly. Another component that I hear a lot in throughout your book is honesty at church on page 74 and 75. Um, you really just go deep and I literally wrote in the margins. Wow. And there was a star and the page numbers were circled. I mean, it really spoke to me. You said, we don't just need a sermon. We need a savior. We don't just need a service. We need our stories. We don't just need scripture. We need surrender. And then you go on to quote um, the story in Luke where the thief is on the cross. And he says, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. So tell me what you mean by saying we need our stories. We need surrender. We need a savior. Like how does honesty at church come to play? And I do want you to tell your personal story when you pro probably, I would say in the, if, if I'm remembering correctly, or if I'm phrasing this correctly, this is maybe when you, you are most honest at church. And I've heard you talk online about, um, sobriety and giving up alcohol completely and how that was such a difficult decision for you. And so honesty at church can be like, skin peeling, like really, really painful. So let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one of the first things you'll hear if you were to put out a random, you know, question online to whoever is that people feel judged at church and that's why they don't go or, uh, there's hypocrites at church and that's why they don't go. Um, that's one of the top things that I heard for sure. And just obviously like, you know, people say that. And so, I am a big fan of vulnerability. Um, I think that we, I think the church needs to be a place where you can walk in and be actually honest and dump all of your crap on the ground and just be who you are. 
and that you're still trying and that you still love Jesus and that's okay. And we're all just struggling. Um, and so I am sort of not, I don't really have a plan, but I have a mission to make the church, um, a more honest and more, more vulnerable place. And I talk about, um, in the book at one point when I was growing up that my pastor sometimes would just, we're not doing church today. I just feel like God's calling me to ask people to come up and you know, repent basically. And and so people would come up and they would just like be super honest about their lives and what they were struggling with. And there was tears and there was crying. And at the time I didn't realize the significance of that. And looking back though, I realized how important that was for people to feel like permission to just be there and be in the middle of their heart hurt and in the middle of their mess and still be there and still feel loved. And so when I was dealing with um, my decision to stop drinking, which, you know, I had this very unhealthy relationship with alcohol, like my, my whole life, like since I started drinking in high school um, and I knew it was a problem for me, you know, I had stopped drinking and my pastors had come to me and asked me like, Hey, would you, you know, we're doing this thing. Would you mind sharing, you know, something that you've overcome? Like they weren't thinking that this was going to be the thing they didn't even know. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> Is this, am I supposed to share this with the whole church? Um, and then like the more I thought about it, the more I felt the answer was yes. And I was like, oh my gosh, but long story short, I did end up going in front of my whole church and sharing my story of struggling with alcohol and deciding to quit. And, um, and I felt that was very important because I wanted people to look at me and you wouldn't have thought that about me. Um, me that, you know, just your mom, your typical mom at church. And I had already written this book and, you know, you would never look at me and think, oh, she has a drinking issue. Um, but I wanted it to be like, yeah, everybody has problems and it's okay. And you can still be here and you can still keep coming. And, you know, that's why I did it. And and honestly, after that, I actually went back to drinking before I quit for good. Um, so there you go. I mean, even mm -hmm. after that, and so now it's been two and a half years since I have, have drank, but I continue to use that testimony because I think it makes people realize that I'm a safe person and I want people to view church as a safe place. Um, I want people to be like, oh yeah, that's a place when I need help, I go there. That's a place where people are, there's no barrier to entry. Um, I want pastors to be vulnerable. I want churches to uplift voices of people's stories um, so that people can feel that they're not alone. And, and I learned this from my alcohol um, recovery meetings where they're not Christian at all, but people come in there and they're like, you know, I got a DUI or, you know, my brother like committed suicide six months ago or my dog just, I mean, like people are dropping bombs every five minutes in these meetings. Mm -hmm. Like this is what church should be. You know, I want these people in church. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so I'm like, let's make church more like an AA meeting and I'm going to keep saying <laughs> it. And I think, you know, that's part, I'm already thinking my next book is going to be related to all of this. So, oh, that's so interesting because when you said let's make church like an AA meeting, I was thinking that's a good book title. <laughs> I, I have loved the way you've talked about your relationship with alcohol because it opened my eyes and I keep remembering this family in church um, when I was growing up where the mom come to find out, you know, she was kind of losing herself in wine and, and it, it hurts my heart because like you said, I would, I would have never guessed that that's what she was struggling with. Um, and there's really no way to know unless people do open up and be vulnerable and just the presence of having a small group or accountability groups where there's an intimate setting where people can be more honest and vulnerable because they might not want to grab a microphone and, you know, shout it from the world, yeah. what they're doing on Thursday nights, but they <laughs> will open up if you give them the space and if you give them the opportunity. Yeah. And, and I would say it didn't start with the church stage for me. It started in my small group. That was the first time I admitted it to anybody. And that was at least a year before that happened. So that's where it began. And I remember before I had opened up to my small group, 
I was like so terrified to say anything because I was like, oh, I just thought, I don't know what people are going to think of me. And now it's so funny because I'm so open about it and I like don't care at all. Um, <laughs> but if you've never told before and you, you just have all these crazy fears and, um, and so it has to start somewhere and that's, we can provide those places for people. The third aspect, which we've actually already touched on is beauty and community. You say on page 41, there's something you'll find at a local church that isn't present at a book club or a mom's meetup or an art class. When you, when I was reading this page, I immediately thought of risen motherhood. And then on the very next page, you quoted risen motherhood. And I was like, yes, because that's when you meet people who are older or in different life stages. So why is it important to have diversity in the church? Oh yeah. I mean, I say this over and over that everyone has their own unique spiritual gift. So I mean, there's diversity in that no matter where you are really. But I I think one thing that's overlooked a lot in terms of diversity is, is intergenerational diversity. Um, I don't think there is enough effort to like kind of have younger people be interacting with older people. Um, just because like, it's just such a, a different life experience when you're 75 versus, you know, 25. And I talk in the book, you, I'm sure you read about, I was in a small group in college where our our mentor leader of our small group is like 90 years old, (laughs) which is insane. Like she was so healthy and like, you wouldn't have never known she was 90 years old, but still like, Oh my gosh, we're a bunch of 20 year old college girls. And this 90 year old woman is leading us. I mean, that's a cool experience. And so I think that is like sort of a plus about smaller churches is that you're kind of forced to really interact and sort of be mentored or discipled by, or just, you know, kind of live life by, um, people of all different ages, because that's just the nature of a smaller church. Um, whereas a a larger church, you're more likely to sort of pair off according to demographic style. Um, but I think, you know, diversity in age, diversity in, you know, ethnicity, skin color, I think that's really important as well because we all have different life experiences. So the more that you can have that, I mean, I, I don't think that these things are like the number one priorities, but I think they are things that are worth considering, um, because, you know, we are all made in God's image, but we also come from different places and spaces and have a lot to teach each other. One interesting thing I found throughout your book is that you quote a lot of statistics. You did a lot of research. I really did feel like I was learning things that I wouldn't have known otherwise. It's not just your personal opinion. You found out what other people were doing, why other people were doing it, and what the statistics show. And I know in the beginning of the book, you give some alarming statistics about why women aren't going to church or what is the what is keeping them from community and then also the mental health rates and how church and community help with that. And one thing that really stuck out to me was on page 96, this is actually a quote from a therapist. There's an important place in our society for church, all the people I work with, all their mental health struggles. So much of the problem is rooted in a sense of needing a purpose, community and support. That hole can be filled through the church. So I often encourage my clients to go to church. Now, is this the same therapist who said they encourage their clients to believe in God, or at least tell their children to believe in God, even if, (laughs) even if they don't. So that therapist was, is a person I don't know. Um, The one that you just quoted is actually a friend of mine and she's a a therapist and she's not a Christian. um, But I I did sit down to coffee with her to talk about this. And that was what she said. So she's very, um, she's a really cool person. And she totally encourages people to go to church, even though she doesn't go to church herself. How do you think the church can fill those needs of purpose, community and support? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that just kind of makes me think that people always, I hear criticisms of the church, like that saying that the church tells people not to use medicine for depression. I just have to clarify. That's not what I'm saying. Um, I am personally on an antidepressant and have been for years. So, um, I think there's a place for medicine and, you know, professional therapy and things like that for sure. Um, but you know, statistics show that those who are consistently involved in as in a part of a faith community do have a greater sense of purpose they have a happier life they are less anxious they are less depressed they are more um, civically involved they are far more generous in their personal lives and 
you have to, you really can't deny what that, those numbers say. And these are numbers from Gallup and Pew. And, and so you have to say, why, why are people that go to church? And this is, I mean, it really is across the board. So you, we're talking also about people that are like Muslim or Jewish, any religion, if you're consistently involved, these mental health states are better. Um, of course, in the United States, that's mostly going to be Christians going to church. And so that's what I focused on. Um, but I think that, you know, this connection with other people is how God created us to be. Um, I think he, you know, we see that we are all image bearers. So even if you're not a Christian, we see how the communal aspect of life bears out positively, even outside of church. Um, it's just almost to another level for believers that are part of the church. Um, so you look at, you know, people like you look at people being involved in, you know, community centers or, you know, volunteer projects or whatever, anywhere you see people coming together as groups, um, you see positive mental health movement (laughs) and that's just all there is to it. And so Christians specifically are called to be a part of the church And when they do that, life flourishes and that's how God created us. And that's why it happens because that was his natural order of things. And when we follow God's natural order of things, life is better. I'm glad you mentioned the groups because you talk later about how you do attend secular events and you do hang out in non-Christian groups. And we already talked a little bit about AA and what the difference is between those types of groups and the church. So, um, you say there's a lot of self-love and support there, which can be great, but I also need to be surrounded by folks who know my heart for the Lord and can uphold me with scripture and his promises when those of the world don't cut it. How does the church and its beautiful message of the gospel make such a difference compared to those other messages? I think that, um, these places that are, you know, self-love and, you know, you deserve it and stuff like that. Like, of course, you know, that can feel good for a moment, but like it ultimately comes back to like, it's all about you. And when you make yourself like the highest honor in your own life, like it really, I think ultimately is toxic and makes you sick. Um, when you're living for yourself, Um, at the end of the day, like, what is there to look forward to? How disappointing is that? (laughs) Like, I mean, you know, it's, it's the whole, you are enough, um, mentality, which, you know, I can say that I'm, I am enough only with Christ and people don't like that. We are not enough, you know, like Ali Beth Stuckey, I'm trying to remember how she puts it, but she's like, if you're going to yourself for the remedy to the problem that is yourself, that's not going to work. When, when you talk about what's the difference coming together as a church, as opposed to like a secular group, I think it's, I mean, it's the Holy spirit, like, because, you know, before Jesus left this earth, he said, I'm leaving you with, um, with a friend, basically I'm leaving the Holy spirit here with you. So it's not that the Holy spirit can't be hanging out in the gym or whatever, but the Holy spirit is, you know, alive and well and thriving in your presence when you're there to glorify and worship God together. And again, I say this, um, if you are a Christian, you should care about this. I mean, I understand that if you, if you're not a Christian, well, why would you care? I get it. But if you are a Christian, like you should care about this and you should care about getting to know God on a deeper level than you already do, which is always possible because he's like infinitely Mm -hmm. mysterious. Um, and what I think is that every believer has a different relationship with God. Right. And every believer has a different like sort of view of God, not, not like the core doctrines or anything, but just like how we see him is from our own sort of personal relationship with him. And so when we come together and the Holy spirit shows up, we almost, we get this dimension, we get this vision of this dimension of God that we can't see when we're alone. Like if there's 10 people gathered and the Holy Spirit is among them. I get to see 10 new angles of God that I didn't get to see when I was just hanging out by myself. And that is like a true motivation to want to gather because we should be hungry for more of God. And that's one of the most beautiful ways we can get more of him is through our believers, you know, the, through the church who he loves and who he reveals himself 
to. And in the Bible, it's not like Jesus died for you. Yes, Jesus died for you. But it's like he gave his blood for the church. That tells you something. It's not just about you. <laughs> it's about a people. And you're part of that people. And and I think people forget that because all they're like, oh, I have a personal relationship with God. Yeah, you have a personal relationship with God. You also have a communal relationship with God. And actually, that's you know one of the primary ways he views you as part of that community. Wow, that's so interesting. I've never heard it that way. I've never thought about it that way. And I like how you put the emphasis on Yes, you have a personal relationship with your God, but there's also a communal part and we are a body. Yes. You can't live out your mission as a Christian by yourself. You can't. Yeah. 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 What's the point? If you're not sharing the gospel and you don't share the gospel alone, people in the Bible, they didn't go alone. They always had a friend. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you touch on that so often. I think this last point, beauty and community could have been like all three of the points. It was just so prevalent throughout the whole book, how you made it really appealing. Like you kind of made people crave it. At least I craved it and I already have it kind of, I mean, we, (laughs) I've had many church experiences. Um, but more recently we moved here to Georgia. And then we started attending a church and then we just like straight up left and started attending another church. And I felt very weird about it. I thought this isn't right. This isn't how you're supposed to do it. But the weekend that Kevin and I both thought about it separately and then talked about it together confirmed to both of us that, okay, it's time to find something else. And I, I still struggle with that. I just didn't like the transition of Mm, feeling, you know, feeling a little bit flaky, but reading your book helped remind me that my soul was so thirsty for good community. And that first church was amazing at so many things, but what our family needed at that point in time, which was just a few months ago was not being met. And the the term church shopping can you know be feel really ugly it can feel really um disloyal or too picky like we're just like sitting there with plates in front of us and just like no i don't want to eat that no i don't want to eat that no i don't want to eat that but when we we came to this church that we're attending now i felt like god was confirming like this is kind of what your heart was craving right okay here it is and i was just so thankful because it's been a huge answer to prayer. I could go back to the alcohol journey. It's like God's saying like, you, you don't, you can't, we can't ever see that bigger picture, you know, of what God has over the mountain for us or whatever. And, um, it's like, life is so much better on the other side of alcohol for me, but like, it took me so long to believe that God had that for me. Um, and so we don't know what God has planned, which is why we have to follow him. Even when, even when we don't understand it. Well, this is a great segue to the final quote, which I love so much. It's it's actually near the beginning of the book, but I wrote a big yes underneath. It says, because even if God is everywhere and we don't need a building to find him, it helps to seek him in tangible ways in places of respite where others can help carry us toward him if it feels too hard to walk alone. And that sums up the book for me. I feel like you did an amazing job. Like I said, just encouraging women to see the beauty in church, not only why we need it, but also why the church needs us. So amazing job. All of your research totally paid off. I really hope that the rest of, you know, all of your years in launching this book and your next books, um, go well, because you are fighting for the gospel. And I, I, I look to you for kind of just like wisdom about what's going on in the world, Um, because you care more about what's going on in the world than (laughs) I care about what's going on in the world. So, (laughs) but I appreciate your voice. So um, tell us where um, my listeners can find you and what you're working on next. Yeah, you can find me on, I guess, Instagram, Erica underscore Anderson or Erica Anderson.com is my website. And you can get the book anywhere, Amazon, Christian book, all the things. In terms of what I'm working at, well, you know, I am a freelance writer, so I'm always writing articles. I I write articles for World Magazine. Um, I'm an opinion columnist there, so you can usually see recent things I've written there. Um, But hopefully I'll be working on a third book. I currently only have a Google Doc with some random ideas written down, but 
I would like to write a book proposal and get it going, uh, a book that will be related to Christian women and addiction. I'm sure the church will be a part of it. I can't wait to see what happens next, but um, go ahead and ride this train for a while because you did a lot of work. So good job getting it out into the world. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Book Therapy. Today's book was Reason to Return by Erica Anderson. Once again, you can find her at ericaanderson.com. And if you like her content, I definitely recommend checking out her podcast, Worth Your Time Podcast, as well as following her on Instagram. Okay, that's all for today. See you next time. Yeah, I think I got it. I got it. Like Um, the culture of of, whatever. Say whatever you want, Erica. (laughs) You're like my news source. I'm just kidding. You're not my news source. Kevin (laughs) is, but...